Welcome to the James R. Meller Lecture. This lecture showcases an individual whose leadership has contributed to the public good. Its intent is to inspire the ideals of students and other members of our university community. It is made possible through a substantial endowment provided by Jim Meller, class of 1952E and 1954E, and also Suzanne Meller, his wife. Uh, Jim, we so much appreciate your support. <laughs> it is always good to see Jim. He came just to, just to witness our weather here, so thanks, Jim. <laughs> Today's Meller Lecture is hosted by uh, the CFE, the Center for Entrepreneurship, Entrepreneurship Hour. And I'm pleased that so many students could join us here up in the dark, it's hard to see you at the moment, uh, for this collaboratively presented event. Following our keynote speaker, please remain with us for brief remarks by the benefactor of today's event. We'll conclude the afternoon with a reception just outside in the lobby area. We're honored to have with us as this year's Meller lecturer, Dixon Dahl, co-founder and general partner of DCM. DCM helps entrepreneurs to build high-impact global technology companies. This venture capital firm has more than $2.5 billion under management. DCM has invested in more than 200 technology companies across the United States and also in Asia. With offices in Silicon Valley, Beijing, and Tokyo, DCM empowers entrepreneurs with hands-on operational guidance and a global network of business and financial resources. It is regarded as the first Silicon Valley venture capital firm to enter China. Recently, DCM was ranked the number six global venture capital firm by Red Herring and venture capital firm of the year in China by VCJ. For four consecutive years, Dixon Dahl was named to the Forbes Midas list of best venture investors in the world. He received the 2013 Special Achievement Award in Venture Capital from the International Business Forum. He has served as chairman of the board of the National Venture Capital Association. Under his leadership, NVCA's recommendations to stimulate liquidity in the U.S. venture capital industry led to the bipartisan congressional support. It's amazing that anything could be bipartisan these days for the new job creation, legislation, and simplification, simplification of the IPO process for emerging companies. Ultimately, President Obama signed the Jobs Act into law in 2012. In an article last year in the San Jose Mercury News, Dixon was quoted as saying, a thriving VC industry is vital to job creation, improving people's lives, and stimulating economic growth. Prior to co-founding DCM in 1996, Dixon launched the venture capital industry's first fund focused solely on telecommunications. Also, he founded and ran a strategic technology consulting firm. He served on the faculty of the IBM Systems Research Institute in New York City for 10 years, and he published Data Communications, a textbook that was adopted by more than 60 universities. Dixon earned his master's and PhD degrees in electrical engineering right here in the college in 1965 and 1969, respectively. And there, here, he was a National Science Foundation scholar. Dixon is joined today uh, by Carol, his wife, who earned her BA in speech and also her teaching certificate from the University of Michigan. Also, we're pleased uh, to have with us several distinguished longtime friends of the Dolls. Uh, who live in this area. Dixon and Carol spent many years as members of the Ann Arbor community, and we are delighted to welcome them all back home. So please join me in welcoming today's Meller lecturer, Dixon Dahl. Thank you. Great art. Thank you. Uh, before uh, discussing the subject of my talk, I want to start out uh, by telling all of the students that you have picked a fabulous place to come and get educated, and uh, you're going to someday be uh, very, very proud of uh, the degrees that you uh, have from the uh, engineering school here or the other related schools at the University of Michigan. And uh, one of my hopes today is to get you excited about all the opportunities that lie out there as you go forward and finish your uh, academic careers and uh, move on into the, uh, the real world or whatever else life has in store for you. 
I also wanted to thank Dean Munson and uh, Mr. Miller for those uh, wonderful opening remarks. Thank all of our friends who he referred to from the Ann Arbor area. And uh, most of all, uh, my lovely wife, Carol, and best, who's a uh, best friend uh, for all of her support and uh, a a companionship over the years. And um, so we're uh, now about ready to, to get started. What I want to do is, um, is talk about uh, very briefly the uh, subject of uh, why uh, this t technology uh, business that you are all um, involved in uh, or, or, or hope to be involved in someday is really vital to the world. This is not a narrow statement, it's a, intended to be a broad statement. And I think there's an awful lot of uh, you know, um, need for uh, people broadly to, uh, to get educated about uh, where jobs come from and all over the world, but certainly here in our own country. And um, the, the primary source of, uh, of jobs, if you go back and look through studies by the Kauffman Foundation, I'll cut right to the chase. Uh, it's a combination of um, investment by uh, angels and venture capitalists and small businesses. And if, in fact, um, there's a evidence out there all over the marketplace that if we didn't have the, those forms of investment, we would have had no new jobs created in this country in the last 25 years. The annual revenue of venture-backed companies is 21% of the, um, the U.S. GDP. Uh, just for those of you that would like a... Uh, you know, uh, Layman's definition, uh, venture capital is, involves four steps here, where a fund like the ones that we uh, have organized goes out and raises capital from uh, limited partners. Uh, it makes investments in exciting companies uh, for a certain percentage of ownership. We spend a long time working with these entrepreneurs, providing lots of value add, and then hopefully uh, we have the uh, successful exit, either in the form of an initial public offering, which is the IPO term, or a merger and acquisition event, which happens when one company acquires another one, to generate um, you know, returns and outsized uh, uh, investment uh, performance for the, uh, the groups that uh, invest in it. And by the way, the University of Michigan does have a very active uh, investment program here, and so it's been uh, fortunate to uh, be involved in some of the best performing funds for a long time. Why does this matter? What you're involved in uh, when you go out into the world after an en engineering um, education here is um, you're going to be involved in you know, any one of a number of different uh, sectors. Uh, the most uh, popularly invested sector has been information technology for quite a long time. But it isn't just about the money, it's about the quality of life impact that uh, venture-backed life sciences companies. Uh, recent s surveys by the NVCA, National Venture Capital Association, one in three people have had the quality of their lives helped by uh, venture-backed life science companies. And clean tech is a similar effort uh, designed to make us become more um, energy independent, uh, and a lot of uh, very great companies have uh, contributed to uh, that. So just to summarize all of that, um, venture capitalists back innovation companies venture capital didn't exist, it's, uh, it's, it's likely that uh, not, none of these companies might ever have been created. And so it's not just uh, recently, but it goes all the way back to the uh, middle 1970s. This is a more recent example of something that uh, wouldn't happen, uh, have happened without VC, uh, namely uh, Tesla Motor Car, which is um, you know, launching uh, all over the world now and really changing the uh, automotive industry in a dramatic way. All right, just to say a couple of words on venture capital and its relation to job creation, uh, the, slide, or the part of the slide over here on your left is uh, making one simple point, and that is if you survey job creation by all companies out there in the universe versus venture-backed companies, venture-backed companies create jobs three times faster than uh, all companies in general. Very importantly, this is... a uh, an important fact and why IPOs are uh, critical is that 92% of that job creation in these venture-backed companies occurs after they go public. So if they don't go public, you don't get that 92% uh, pop there. Another uh, third benefit that I referred to um, a minute ago is that um, top venture investors also generate uh, outsized returns from uh, making investments in venture capital. And you see here the 15-year uh, annualized performance for early stage venture capital, 82% IRR. And if you go back 20, 30, 40 years, these numbers are not a whole lot different. 
you can't get investment returns uh, like that in any of the standard um, asset classes shown on the bottom half of the chart. So in summary, we create transformative new companies, uh, we create jobs, and we provide superior investment returns. So Dean alluded very briefly to the, the Jobs Act work, and I'm gonna go through this quite uh, rapidly. In 2008, um, I was involved in uh, heading the association, and we, uh, we woke up in Q2 of that year and found out that we had no IPOs, zero, of technology-backed companies. That's a disaster that had not happened uh, since the middle 1970s. So I said we had to sit down and look at it as a, a whole industry and figure out what we might um, do. This is just a plot here from uh, the early 90s all the way through to 2008, which is the low water mark uh, for the, the last basically um, 18, 19 years. So we decided to organize the uh, various components of the venture ecosystem. I won't go through all of these here. Uh, they're, uh, it's a complex ecosystem and um, you, you have to come up with policies and, uh, and changes that everybody buys into or they won't work at all. So we put together a four pillar plan and uh, unveiled it in the spring of 2008 uh, that resulted in recommendations uh, that, uh, of things that could be done by the venture industry and by the government in tandem. We worked uh, three years with a team of people here, this little photo was taken from the White House uh, when we were signing the Jobs Act. And uh, it actually is amazing to repeat what Dean Munson said, that some uh, bipartisan legislation uh, can come out of Washington, period. And I'm hopeful that that'll happen again going forward. So we'll skip over these details here so that we have other things to talk about. But there, there is hope that you can actually get something done here that's uh, going to be positive to the economy as a result of some of the changes that uh, have been made now to stimulate uh, IPO activity. So the last point in this chart then is to simply say that since the Jobs Act was passed, you see the capital markets have begun to improve very considerably, going up uh, from um, 65 tech IPOs in 2013 to uh, 115 uh, this year so far. And that same outstanding performance is being uh, observed in both uh, Europe and Asia as well. I want to conclude this uh, portion of the uh, discussion by uh, calling a couple of remaining points to mind in a venture capital survey that's conducted um, every year by uh, Deloitte and Touche. They surveyed uh, respondents in, um, I think it's about 15 countries here, the U.S. came in as the country in which uh, all the survey recipients had the most confidence of making venture capital investments. However, there's a big problem also. We are uh, dead last in terms of uh, the country where people have uh, a belief that the government will support venture-friendly investment policy. So uh, we're working to change all of that. and. Um, Th th these kinds of steps, uh, immigration reform is certainly uh, very high on the radar screen uh, today. And um, we're hoping that um, the next couple of years here will uh, help us make some additional changes that will further improve this uh, very important system. Um, what I'd like to do next is to um, talk to you a little bit about um, some of the um, experiences that, um, that I had uh, during my uh, time here at um, the University of Michigan. And um, you can think of me as somebody that was here in your own uh, shoes uh, back about, um, I, don't, I don't even want to mention how many years it's been so long ago. But I got to Michigan because I didn't really honestly know what I wanted to do, but I came up here um, <coughs> and did my master's and uh, that clock ran out awfully fast. And I, last thing in the world I wanted to do after the first year of master's is to go and get a big job with an aerospace company in Southern California. So. I decided to sign up for the doctoral program, and uh, I went through a lot of um, interesting experiences. I know many of you are undergrads, uh, so um, maybe someday you'll be able to, um, you know, to get to, uh, you know, uh, experience the uh, the joys and the tribulations of doing a doctoral program. But one of the things that um, that happened to me as I I got through my, um, you know, uh, prelims and so on and so forth. Um, I was given the opportunity to take on some part-time work uh, with a uh, number of companies here locally, and so that kind of got me involved in being exposed to business. And so 
everything in my mind said, you know, Dixon, you really like uh, this, this, um, you know, this technology and, uh, and all the other stuff that you're studying here, but, but you also have a, a, I had a considerable interest in doing, uh, you know, business, um, as I learned from some of these uh, brief consulting experiences. So I ended up um, going to work uh, for a startup right after I got my doctorate, and this was one of the most uh, informative experiences of my life. It uh, was a startup here in Ann Arbor that failed. And everybody was laid off and uh, all had to go out and find new jobs and um, start all over again. But what I concluded from that experience was that um, there were a lot of venture capitalists out there in the world that didn't know what they were doing. And so I said, this might be an interesting business to go into someday and, tr and try to do it right. So I spent a number of um, you know, years um, working for, um, a, on a consulting basis for IBM in New York City, where I traveled back and forth. That's where I had the opportunity to publish the book. And um, this consulting success and some of the other uh, activities led me to start getting requirements and requests for um, helping uh, telecom and networking companies in Silicon Valley. So after a lot of deliberation, I decided to, uh, to go into the venture capital industry for a career in uh, 1985. Um, I'll fast forward uh, through a couple of points here because um, Dean Munson uh, indicated um, you know, some of those accomplishments. Uh, since uh, 08 and 09, I've been uh, very passionate about the subjects that, uh, that I talked to you about in the opening remarks here. And I'm uh, now uh, spending, looking forward to spending more time uh, on philanthropy. Uh, I'm going to continue to be very actively involved in, uh, in doing deals and working with, uh, you know, uh, organizations that, uh, where I think I can make a difference. And I lo really look forward to, uh, you know, continuing to uh, make a contribution in meaningful ways uh, here uh, at the um, University of Michigan. So I wanted uh, to insert a couple of uh, personal experiences here. Uh, about uh, my uh, actual getting uh, the, the PhD here. Uh, my degree came as uh, was indicated in uh, 1969. Here's an interesting fact. At that point in time, uh, computer science and electrical engineering had not yet crystallized or matured to the uh, point that they have um, you know, since then. So we were actually given the uh, opportunity to, to select either title on our degree. And that was the last time that that was ever possible. After that, you had a certain curriculum, you had a certain degree to go with it. So I decided to pick the uh, EE because I felt it would be more generalized and uh, more broadly applicable uh, rather than computer science, but we certainly had a uh, fabulous computer science training, uh, as I'm sure you guys and gals are uh, here in your experiences at Michigan today. Um, getting the doctoral degree is a long and sometimes uh, frustrating process that requires uh, patience and perseverance. Uh, there's a significant opportunity for you to learn how to solve really complex problems uh, because you get forced to look at what you want to do for your doctorate and uh, define the problem and so on. You um, have to have a support system. Uh, I was fortunate to have Carol and my family that uh, were completely 1,000% supportive through that whole exercise. And you um, have to look at the um, theses uh, and, and to see what it's like. Look at the end product that you're going to produce uh, before. So I went in one day to uh, Norman Scott, who was um, my, uh, one, my, one of my advisors, and I, looked, I just picked a book out of random from his bookshelf, and it was called The Relational Model, and it was done by somebody named Ted Codd. It turns out that uh, about five or six years later, that, that thesis uh, inspired and led to the formation of uh, one of the greatest technology companies in the world today, the Oracle Corporation, which was based on a computer implementation of the, uh, the original work that was done in that thesis here in Michigan. Another little anecdote is, um, I had a really good friend who sponsored us in uh, Silicon Valley uh, by the name of Don Lucas, and he only allowed uh, two companies in all the years that he was there to start in his office, and one of them uh, was Oracle, and the other one was uh, my firm, Dahl Capital Management. So there are a lot of good things that um, can come out of uh, you know, uh, an advanced degree here at the University of Michigan, and I'm very fortunate to, uh, to have been, uh, been able to uh, you know, to, uh, to have that experience. Um, 
The only other thing that I can say that I learned from uh, getting my PhD is there's the old saying about you can fool some of the people all the time and all the people some of the time, but to get a PhD, you only have to fool one person one time. <laughs> um, let's see here. So I think uh, we're doing pretty well on time, but um, I'd like to, um, to next um, turn the uh, topic of the discussion here to um, some interesting new uh, areas that get me excited, and this is mainly for the benefit of the students, but obviously for everybody else. Um, so I, this, this is in no order of priority, but I want you to know I've never seen a time or a place in my career where there is uh, more opportunity for talented uh, engineering students to, uh, to go out and break new ground and, um, and change the world in a better way and possibly start companies, uh, work, work in your own uh, firm, et cetera. So um, one of the things that I, when I met Dean uh, Munson the first time, uh, we talked a lot about uh, things. We had another good chat this morning. Um, I, I become totally convinced, even though life sciences is not my area of expertise, that um, the opportunities for uh, engineering uh, students to uh, make a huge difference in the life sciences area has never been uh, greater. And um, I think that um, you should just pay a lot of attention to that, especially if you have any interest in that particular area. Another thing that, um, that is, is very transformative and very important these days is the uh, t the topic of, uh, I don't like the topic, but some people uh, use the term big data. I much prefer to call it uh, data analytics, which is, you know, capturing all the uh, huge amounts of information that go on in complex um, technology environments and allowing that data to be converted to information so that people managing and using these uh, complex systems can uh, make better decisions. And I think that, um, is, that area is just barely scratching the surface right now in terms of additional opportunity here. Um, I think that um, the whole mobile area of um, you know, applications and the uh, uh, social networking uh, ecosystems is still in its uh, early stages of infancy. I believe that um, the area that, uh, that I got started in, communications infrastructure, is undergoing a massive change right now in which um, the uh, telephone companies are merging with um, the content companies uh, like Netflix and uh, with um, you know, mobile companies and uh, all these kinds of um, traditionally se separate or disparate um, components of the communications ecosystem are now coming together. And um, there's a huge transformation going on uh, all over the world um, in these regards. Um, I think that um, the, the role of content, and um, just think about that. The best way to think about what, what I mean by content is the stuff that you see when you watch Netflix. The traditional television is going away as fast as you can uh, possibly imagine. Millennials today don't uh, watch traditional television. If you talk to any of your family uh, down in that age group or uh, any of your children and watch what, you know, what, they, uh, what they look at, the, the idea of a, of a big dedicated screen in people's living rooms is, uh, except maybe for some of those um, at you know, my age, uh, is, is gonna go away very, very fast. About 10 years ago, the old statement of, in the uh, cable, television, and satellite uh, uh, industries used to be that um, distribution is God and uh, content is king. Now the, um, the, the, that, al that algorithm has flipped its head because um, distribution is king and content is now God. Content is everything and it's, it's all about um, not just being used for entertainment either, but it's the video uh, training and uh, packaging that you, um, that you experience as a student uh, and all the different websites that you go to in order to learn about a particular subject. So I think that that's going to be a, a booming business for many years to come, both in terms of the entertainment component as well as the uh, the, um, you know, the uh, education component and many other uh, different uses beyond uh, entertainment. Some more here. Uh, environmental protection uh, is, is obviously important. Uh, we don't maybe appreciate it uh, here as much as we should, but if you go to Beijing sometime, you'll find out that uh, the lives of people over there are cutting, being cut 10 to 12% short because of the pollution. 
And the Chinese government continues to, uh, uh, to talk a good game about uh, doing things to fix that, but uh, on this, by the same token, they, if they shut it down, they're going to end up uh, completely uh, you know, disrupting some of their uh, conventional industries there, and so they've been very reluctant to, to do anything about it. Energy efficient enhancement, uh, you know, robotics, um, drones, driverless cars, uh, cybersecurity, um, and um, new waves of uh, self-learning enterprise software tools uh, that uh, focus on uh, more on the context of the acts being formed. And this is all done uh, with the purpose of helping um, workers in big businesses spend less and less of their time processing uh, email and doing routine chores and tasks and more time making important uh, decisions. So um, I think uh, in conclusion, I'd like to um, leave a few words of uh, wisdom and um, some of the lessons learned. I think uh, for sure that success in almost every organization that I've been involved with, including the ones that I was directly involved with versus those that I financed or worked with to help build, depends on uh, the building and construction of great teams with great leadership. I'm gonna encourage everybody here to be very curious and think for yourself. Think outside the box. Uh, conventional wisdom frequently isn't. Um, it's okay to fail. Uh, one of the uh, things that differentiates Silicon Valley more than almost any other place on the earth is that it's, it's con widely considered okay to fail. I mean, Steve Jobs, who was the legendary uh, per person that uh, did um, you know, the Apple and, and, uh, and came back again, and made, he had two or three failures in there, and uh, nobody ever thinks a thing about it. The, the only thing that you can be criticized for in the Valley is not trying and not venturing in something if you think there's a reasonable shot at it. Uh, for government educators, I, uh, I think that uh, the right thing to do is to make heroes of your brightest stars. And I appreciate uh, you know, the invitation here today from Dean Munson. I think that uh, uh, the University of Michigan across all different departments and uh, wants to really become increasingly continuing, be increasingly viewed as a great entrepreneurial university, you should find lots and lots of heroes here and uh, have them come back and provide uh, these uh, experiences to share them with the students. And uh, I'm honored that I'm able to, uh, to be able to do that here today. So, final comment. Innovation is truly global. The U.S. is the favorite country for it, uh, for investment, but not for um, you know, government policies uh, that support uh, entrepreneurship. And so we manage, uh, as usual, to continue to make great progress as a a domestic economy in spite of the fact that we have to do it without getting any help uh, from our uh, uh, government resources. So I hope that I've um, given you some uh, good ideas uh, and uh, helped you understand uh, the, how this complicated uh, ecosystem works. Again, I can't thank you enough for the opportunity to be here today. And I'm going to conclude now and then we're going to open it up for questions. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks very much, Dixon, for uh, a really informative talk and a really quick tour of what's occurred over the last several decades in entrepreneurship. So we'll, we will open it up to questions now, and I can't see too well in the auditorium, but we have microphones at the bottom of the steps, he was going to turn the and anybody is welcome yep. to come down, and, and it'd be best if you could use the microphone since this is being recorded, but feel free to, to find your way down and ask a question. Uh, one question I'll ask to get us started, uh, Dixon, is, is really kind of specialized to higher education. Uh, there have been some VC firms uh, making investments uh, in online education and MOOCs and new methods of learning. Do you have any opinions on, on that? Um, I, it's been a tough area so far uh, to make money, and um, the... There does not appear to be any particular uh, model that, uh, that everybody is uh, agreeing to. One of my best friends is the economics professor at Stanford, and uh, they put, you know, they're, they're putting all of the uh, Stanford, uh, you know, the real superstar undergraduate courses uh, online, and um, that's been going pretty well. I'm also on the board at, uh, the, of the Jesuit University at, uh, in San Francisco, and uh, we've had some experiences uh, in, tr in trying MOOCs. 
So I, I think that uh, the, the ideas associated with MOOCs, uh, and there's some central ideas that are working, which is to use the flip ca classroom, mm -hmm. where um, uh, a guy like John Taylor, who's one of the leading econ economics teachers on the planet, uh, doesn't give the lectures anymore, but he comes in and actually has an interactive session uh, a couple of times a week with the students. Uh, I think that is a uh, kind of a no-brainer as far as uh, one element of the model that could uh, could be incorporated, but there have been companies like, uh, I don't want to pick on anybody, but you know, Coursera, e EDX, and uh, some of them started out as nonprofit. It's hard to see that, um, you know, uh, that I, I haven't seen any of these models really taking off, so I don't think that there are any uh, definitive winners in this space with one possible exception, and that would be Sal Khan at the oh, yeah. Khan Academy, right. which right. is a form of what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And that one is uh, widely, by the way, I, I sat at a function with him not too long ago, and he has hired the, one of the greatest teams, 20, 25, 30 people work there, and they don't get equity, hmm. uh, which is shocking in the Silicon Valley. These people are just working for the common good and the joy of uh, you know, helping others, and they get paid good salaries and good bonuses, uh, but... Uh, you know, it, it doesn't follow the, uh, conven it defies the conventional model of, uh, you know, starting a company like I had up there. So uh, he's never taken venture capital. I keep asking that, but uh, <laughs> John Doerr, who backed it, um, he said that uh, it's just um, not something they want to do. I mean, I guarantee you if they wanted to do venture capital, John Doerr was all over that and he would have put some in, but uh, that, they just didn't want it. Another question, uh, heading, heading our thoughts overseas. Uh, you got involved as a venture capitalist very early in China. So what led you to do that, and, and how has that turned out? Um, one of the things that I learned uh, long ago in the venture industry is you're always looking for uh, new, area, interesting areas of growth uh, that uh, will you know, defy the, you know, the traditional uh, industry growth rates in, uh, in more traditional sectors. So I had some experiences uh, in the 10 years that I worked uh, at Axel where I, I was assigned to go over uh, to Europe and help uh, make introductions and get our portfolio companies uh, hooked up with uh, European distribution partners and things like that. And I saw the effect that it had on the uh, Silicon Valley companies or the East Co Boston based companies in terms of accelerating their growth so they could, these companies could become bigger faster because they're uh, addressing uh, multiple geographies mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. When I left Axel, I met uh, my co-founder who had um, strong ties to Asia and uh, his vision uh, was, and I totally agreed with it, uh, that uh, there were some, gonna be some huge opportunities in China and maybe some smaller ones in Japan. But the one, the, the, when you just look at the size of the Chinese economy and the, the middle class and all of this and, and where they were at that point in time, it was, it was mind boggling. Mm -hmm. So we, we uh, in basically invented you know, a model that we used and that worked very well for us, which was finding US companies and then taking and tweaking and optimizing their business model for uh, the Asian environment. And uh, the other, big thing that we had to do was to hire people um, that had considerable uh, Chinese operating experience and really knew the, the subtleties of the way you do business in China. So we, uh, we hired somebody that uh, my partner had gone to Stanford Business School with who started one of the first internet companies, uh, Sina, in China, and um, he's gone on to have a uh, spectacularly successful run on, uh, on uh, like a half a dozen companies. So we've had like 10 uh, companies that we've actually taken public in the U.S. that are all totally based, all their operations in China. Wow, wow. And then bringing it back home, you've had all this high-level VC experience, but you started out, you had a startup company, yep. and things didn't work out. Right. What happened and what did you learn from that? Um, I was uh, brought in because I had just finished up my... Uh, my doctorate, um, and it was in networking, and this company was building, at that time, an innovative new product uh, uh, to sell, to get faster performance over uh, dial-up networks. It was a forward error correcting uh, dial-up modem. And um, I had done some work, uh, you know, calculating actual throughputs, and I built a few models uh, where you put in all the variables, and um, I, one day I ran a, 
a model that, um, that looked at, put in the performance measures of uh, our product. And I found that because they didn't operate over the uh, most popular protocol, the way IBM was using these things, that, uh, that the market was going to be incredibly small and specialized. And so I pretty much decided that uh, this thing wasn't going to work out and began looking for a new job. But uh, the other thing I learned there was um, that the, uh, you, cannot, you can't overstate the importance of having a strong leader. And uh, that's been the case everywhere I've ever gone. The older I get, uh, the more uh, getting a great CEO in place who can build a great team, the more that becomes important. And, um, and then I think I made a comment in my talk about um, the, the venture capitalists that put money into this company. They didn't understand the market at all. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, they put some more money in when they shouldn't have, and they ended up losing it all. But uh, it's a great experience. Well, I'm still the proud owner of a Sony Betamax VCR. And yeah. uh, somehow that didn't match with the, the standards yeah. others yeah. were going to follow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Any questions from our students? This is the quietest there have to I've be some ever seen you out there. Yes, sir, right in the middle. Um, I think it's uh, kind of difficult to, uh, to do venture while you're doing your degree. So I would tell you to get your degree as fast as possible and go out and uh, get a, a good job um, you know, for a really transformative comp company. Uh, some, some, just arbitrarily, I picked this name out of the, uh, out of the sky, like Google or uh, Apple or uh, Amazon, you know, any of those companies where the money is no object. All they care about is finding the next big thing uh, that's going to really be big and that can be global. And they, they hire the very best uh, talent that they can get, and they can get the very best talent at almost any school, including uh, the University of Michigan. So I commend you on your choice, and uh, that's what I would do if I were in your position. But I, in my own experience, I did find uh, an opportunity to do uh, you know, some consulting while I was in school, and that broadened my, uh, my education and uh, made me more aware of some of the other career choices that, uh, that went on. But that, that could never become a primary thing. It kind of had to be done on a secondary or tertiary basis. Other questions? Yes. Yes. Um, I'd done, I built a consulting practice, um, you know, while I was, um, you know, right after I got out of school, and uh, when I was consulting at IBM, I also had another uh, great uh, consulting client. I was the personal advisor to the uh, CEO and founder of MCI back at a time when it was transforming the telecommunications market. Um, but I, I went out and put a plan together to, to try and, um, you, know, uh, you know, work through trade journals and go to, uh, you know, uh, sessions that the industry put on and uh, get, a, get some personal visibility. And by, um, you know, by, uh, by doing that, I hope to, uh, to get, you know, establish myself as an expert in an important area. And, uh, that, and it worked. And so I had a lot of people from the, um, not a lot, but a, but a significant number of entrepreneurs and uh, board members from uh, Silicon Valley tech companies start calling me and asking me to go on boards. In, the, uh, in Silicon Valley. And this was right around the time when the networking industry was beginning to explode. That was three or four years even before Cisco was, was founded. So I did that and um, I found out that um, I really liked doing that because there's so many more things than uh, such a wonderfully uh, diverse uh, you know, industry in terms of all the skills that you have to have, the things that you keep learning and the people you keep meeting. If you do your job right, oh, by the way, you get some very nice uh, performance, and if you don't, uh, you don't stay in the industry. So uh, uh, that it's, a, it's very much a merit-based system, it's, but it has a lot of politics in it, uh, no surprise. Any other questions? Uh, <coughs> yes, please. Hi, so I worked this last summer in I think the best thing that, uh, that you could do would be to, um, you know, you're, you're doing exactly the right thing you know, right now, or go back and get another job in the summer or whatever it is like the one that you just referred to. 
Get as much operating experience or technical familiarity that you, as you can. That is, uh, Cloudera is the, one of the it's primary platform that people are using for uh, big data solutions uh, almost everywhere that I'm aware of. Yeah, and, but that's, that's not an accident. That is a mega trend that's being driven by this big data. And big data is exploding, not just in, uh, you know, I've forgotten what, 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 what application area did you work in? Uh, so I work in the general Okay. Well, but, but, but it, it's, it's, it's such a mega trend that, uh, that it, you know, things, applications that are going to be written that use uh, Hadoop, uh, they're, they are, uh, they're, just, they're just beginning to get uh, up to critical mass. And uh, you can, you know, companies that have really good teams together uh, in the Valley right now are able to raise enormous sums of money at very high valuations to go out and pursue new industries. Uh, and uh, and it, it's, it's not just confined to, to IT or telecom or anything, it's all these other industries like life sciences, you name it. So that's a really good thing to do, keep doing it. One last question and then we, I want to get our benefactor up here for a couple of minutes. Yes? Uh, there's no question but that the consumer internet, which is the first category that, that you referred to, has been um, an extremely popular uh, area for venture uh, firms to invest in. Um, there's, there's a couple of nasty little uh, problems that uh, consumer internet investments have, which is you got to figure out ways to uh, make sure you don't spend more to acquire a customer than the lifetime value of it, uh, or otherwise you'll be guaranteed to go out of business at some point in time. Uh, but there are other, um, you know, web-based properties that are, that are trying to appeal. Uh, there's enterprise software. Uh, there's a lot of new, um, you know, cloud-based implementations of, uh, uh, and SaaS-based implementations. I mean, it took Oracle forever and ever to, uh, to figure out how to do SaaS. And in the meantime, Salesforce.com, where the guy came from Oracle, has built a multi-billion dollar uh, behemoth, um, and, uh, and so it's, it's about being able to adapt to the change and, um, and look at the areas that you think um, are going to have the, uh, the most growth and one where you're most comfortable with yourself, too. Excellent, Dixon. Thanks so much. Let's thank uh, Dixon Dahl. Thanks. Thanks, Dixon. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, thanks very much, Dixon, for uh, sharing your experience with us. I next want to introduce Jim Meller. Jim is a great friend of the University of Michigan and the College of Engineering. His long and distinguished career culminated in service as chairman and CEO of General Dynamics Corporation. Presently, he serves on the board of the Max Planck Institute. For a decade, he was a member of the College of Engineering's National Advisory Committee. He's received many national awards and honors. Raised in Detroit, Jim is a U of M alum who earned his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and mathematics and his master's degree in electrical engineering in years 1952 and 1954, respectively. He and Suzanne, his wife, uh, offered tremendous support to Michigan Engineering, and that support has included making today's lectureship possible. Please join me in welcoming back to campus Jim Meller. Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, I'm always uh, pleased to return here to Ann Arbor, uh, uh, but not in this kind of weather, I've got to say. Uh, Dave, maybe uh, next year we can think about having this in April and May or something like that. And thank you, and, and thank you, Dixon, for a, for a very stimulating talk. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, the talk by Dixon uh, this morning is what the Meller Lecture is really all about. Over the last uh, several years, we've heard from a politician, uh, chairman and CEOs from some of our uh, more technology 
uh, oriented uh, corporations, entrepreneurs, educators, as well as a venture capitalist uh, uh, this morning. Thanks again, Dixon. Uh, the common thread is that all of the speakers were engineering graduates. And the bottom line is that in engineering education, the education that you're, many of you here are presently receiving, opened so many doors to you, doors you, you can't even envision at, uh, at this point of your life. The, the analytical training that you uh, receive uh, provides you with the knowledge and mindset to solve all sorts of business problems, and leadership challenges, and is really invaluable for success in many fields. Sure, after graduation, you'll probably be involved in a technical discipline, uh, a research lab, project engineer, program manager, perhaps, and have a great and rewarding career. When I left the university, uh, all I wanted to do was be the best engineer that I could be. And I started out on that path. But somehow I got diverted, perhaps some good advice from close friends, uh, mentors along the line. And eventually I became, as, as David's mentioned, the chairman CEO of one of the most successful aerospace and defense companies uh, in our country. It gave me opportunities I, I, I never could have dreamed about, meeting people, visiting countries, beyond uh, my wildest uh, expectations. This lecture series is intended to make you aware of a broader world uh, out there and help you prepare for it and recognize that your education here at Michigan Engineering uh, really well positions you to address a wide range of these opportunities. Uh, thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you again next year. Perhaps it'll be a little warmer and uh, good to see you all. Take care.